If you turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2 for the Sunday school time, and I want to look at uh, a couple verses here and make some applications. As always, you know, we read the Word of God and we don't apply it. It really doesn't help us, does it? Um, you know, there's so much in God's Word, and while some of it is not directly for us, it's true, so much of it is, so much of it is. And certainly here in Colossians chapter 2, verses 4 through 8, I think there's a lot of things here as believers that we can benefit from. You know, the scriptures tell us to be uh, doers of the word, not hearers only, right? And so Colossians chapter 2, verses 4 through 8, we'll read, I'm going to read verses 4 through 8 and then have a word of prayer. Uh, verse 4 says, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye uh, in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your word is forever settled in heaven. I pray now, Lord, for this Sunday school time. It'll be a help to each one here. Lord, just uh, help. It'll be a strengthening to us, Lord. It'll be a challenge to us. Lord, I pray for the other services to follow. And, of course, I want to pray for Pastor and Mrs. Jenkins, Lord, while they're away, to give them safety and a good time away visiting their folks, their children. And, Lord, just guide and direct now in this day, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, uh, this time I want to look at in Colossians, this section here, uh, my title for it is Ways We Can Be Spoiled. Now, I'm not talking about spoiled like, uh, you know, you open your refrigerator and realize that the luncheon meat was in there a tad too long. <laughs> not that kind of spoiled. Uh, but the word spoiled in the older use sometimes can talk about, and sometimes it still uses where, but not much, would be like where an army or robbers would come in and take things or an army would come into a, a, an area and, and spoil it. In other words, take what's there. And uh, we can be robbed or spoiled when it comes to things we believe. And that's, we'll see that a little later on here. But uh, just to kind of get to, uh, to that point, starting with verse 4, Paul here, of course, <clears throat> you know, the, the church at Colossae is a church in Asia Minor. It's a, it was a New Testament model church. But like any uh, local church, uh, it was not immune to those things that were not biblical. I mean, that's just the fact. That's still true today, isn't it? Um, none of us are immune. Local churches aren't immune. And so, notice verse 4, Paul here says, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. First of all, we have a warning to start with in verse 4. The word beguile, what does that mean? The word be deceive, sure. Um, 2 Corinthians 11.3 says Eve was deceived. And so she was, of course, deceived by the serpent. Of course, that was Satan empowering the serpent. But notice here a couple of things. In verse 4, he says, lest any man. It's, you know, just like God uses people to further his work, right? Sadly, Satan uses people too. Um, God uses saved people that are his own, right, that are his children. When a person, isn't that a wonderful truth? When a person is saved, they become a child of God. You know, uh, I, I, I probably mentioned this last time. You know, no world religion claims that. Islam doesn't claim that. Buddhism doesn't claim that. Uh, but the reality is that when a person puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, based on the authority of God's word, they become a child of God. We can say with confidence, he's our heavenly father, because he is. Now, because he is our Heavenly Father, he will chasten us at times, uh, just like a, an earthly father or an earthly parent would do so, because they do love their children. But notice here, uh, any man should beguile you with enticing words. So, you know, we're to be would beware that there are people, and just like, you know, that was true back in this church at Colossae, 1900 and something years ago. You know the only thing that's tr diff different today? It's a lot more situations like that okay it's not less there's more and so in a lot more ways it can happen too see back here in the new testament era um you know they didn't have radio or the internet social media cell phones regular phones 
any kind of phone, okay? They had a lot less ways where people could be communicating, and that's good and bad, right? It's, good, it's bad, but it's bad when it comes to all the avenues that are out there today to deceive people. And let's not, let's not kid ourselves, Satan and this world's system are in the deception business, aren't they? They sure are. Um, but uh, you'll notice here he says, uh, beguile you with enticing words. Now, what do you think that suggests, enticing words? Something that makes it appealing. Flattery could be part of it, too, sure. You know, I think it could be a mix, but it's something that appeals to people, that sounds good. You know what's so sad today, I think, so many professing Christians are in unbiblical churches, and they'll tell you, yeah, but it's, I like what he says. Well, what is he saying? Well, I don't know. <laughs> it sounds good, though. <laughs> well, what is it, how does it line up with the Word of God? Well, we don't use the Bible very much, or if they do, they use 13 different corrupt, perverted versions or something, you know. It's like, whatever. You know, when people, that, by the way, churches that do that, people don't bring Bibles, because after all, they've got so many different corrupt ones. I mean, how, how can you follow it anyway, right? And so, you know what they do? They don't bring anything. They don't bring anything. But uh, I want you to keep your place here in Colossians 2, if you would, and turn to 2 Peter 2, 3, please. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 3. A lot of warnings in the Word of God about uh, this area. And 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3, notice here, in the whole context of 2 Peter chapter 2 is about false teachers. Whole, con whole chapter. All right, now it deals with some other things, but that's the general context of the chapter. 2 Peter 2, 3, Peter here says, And through covetousness shall they with feign words, the word feign is the idea of false words, deceiving words, make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. In other words, God's going to deal with these false teachers. That's the context of the chapter. But uh, so... Uh, enticing words, appealing words, going back to uh, Colossians 2, verse 4. Now, notice the next verse. He says, For though I be absent in the flesh... In other words, Paul wasn't physically there, was he? He was writing a letter to them under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It says, Yet I am with you in the Spirit, joy in beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Now, while verse 4 is primarily a warning... Verse 5 is an encouragement. And the Word of God has both. We need both. We need both. We can't just have messages about encouragement, although that's very much needed. We have to have messages about warning. But we can't just have messages about warning, can we? We need the encouragement. And so the Word of God has both for us. But notice what he commends them for in verse 5. And you know what? Any local church ought to desire to have these qualities. In verse 5, he says, For though I be absent with you in the flesh, yet I am with you in the spirit. Notice, joying and beholding what? Their order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. The word order, the idea that they were doing things that were scriptural. They were being obedient to the word of God. So many churches today are unscriptural in their practices. The problem is they're doing it because of traditions. They're doing it because that's, well, that's how we always did it. That's how headquarters has us do it in these denominational churches, you know. But uh, or that's how, you know, uh, whatever our, our church uh, rule book says to do it. But uh, you know what? If it doesn't line up with the Word of God, it's wrong. Simple as that. It, it doesn't matter how long they've been doing it. You know, let's just give you a quick example. I have a theology text from a Reformed theology writer back in the middle 1900s. Uh, and uh, his excuse for infant baptism, one of his, he's trying to justify it, right? Of course, it's not biblical. It's, <laughs> it's not biblical. It can't be biblical whatsoever. It's no way. But uh, one of his excuses is, well, that's how we've been doing it for 1,700 years in various churches. Well, I don't care if they've been doing it. Look, people have been worshiping idols for thousands of years, and it's wrong, all right? So just because they've been doing it a long time doesn't mean it's right. It doesn't matter how long you've been doing it. The standard is, is it line up with the Word of God, the rightly divided Word of God. And so we notice here that uh, he talks about their order, but notice particularly I want to focus for a moment on verse, the last part of verse 5, and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. You know, if there ever was a time when we need to be steadfast, it's today. 
when the winds of change are the strongest, when there's so much Satan this world system wants us to move, and we're going to get to that a little bit more here in a minute, you know, more, how much more important to be steadfast? You know, the hardest thing in the world is just to stay in place <laughs> sometimes. You might think, well, that's easy, right? No, not if you have a lot of force trying to move you. Imagine like if I'm trying to stand here and some big, strong guy is pushing me, it's going to be hard for me to stay in place. I'm going to have to really work at trying to stay in place, right? And so I might want to hold on to something. I might want to hold on to something, especially if he's a lot stronger than me, which wouldn't be too hard to do, okay? So notice their steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Could go there, that could be a message to itself. I probably have a message on that. But uh, the importance of being steadfast. We have a world that's constantly changing. America's changing, sadly, as a culture. I mean, I could go into so many, but I don't think I need to, right? I think most of us already know that, right? We already realize how quickly, you know, I was just listening to uh, uh, on, 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 on talk radio coming up here. I don't make a steady diet of some of that, because you got to, a lot of you have to watch what you listen to. A lot of people are unsaved. Most, most of them are unsaved people. But I'm just saying they were talking about the fact, that, and this is a fact, how quickly the public attitude in America is, is, has changed on same-sex marriage, right? So-called marriage. It's not marriage. It's an abomination. It's what it is. It has nothing to do with God's original plan of marriage. Uh, it is a satanic thing. Uh, boy, that's not politically correct, but oh well. <laughs> but... Uh, you notice here, he says, you know, steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Now, let's look at verse 6 here. It says, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. In other words, now that you're saved, that's what he's saying, since you've received Christ, notice, is it stop with it? Salvation stops with, with salvation, doesn't it? It's not a progressive salvation. Salvation is a one-time thing. But once we're saved, now we need to live for the Lord, right? Once we're saved... Now we need to serve God. Uh, once we're saved, we begin what's sometimes referred to, and you can see it here, the Christian walk. So notice, he says, so walk ye in who? In him. In him. Well, we can, people have all kinds of walks in terms of followings, but so many in this world, the majority in this world, sadly, aren't walking in him. Why? Well, they're not saved. Lost people are not walking in Christ. They can't. They don't belong to him. They're not born again. They're not a child of God. They're walking in something. They're following. Everybody's, you know what? Everybody's following something. The atheist is following something. That's right. He's following the world's philosophies. He's following his own heart, which he can't know. Okay. He's constantly changing in his thinking. So the importance of walking in him. Um, we receive Christ by faith. And our walk should be one of faith. Uh, keep your place there and just look back at Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. In the opening part of this book, Paul here encouraging the Colossian believers says in verse 10 that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. But that's a message in that verse by itself. I'll try, Lord willing, develop that sometime. But uh, I don't know about you, but with the Lord's help, I desire to have a worthy walk. Do I always have a worthy walk? No, I do not. I will tell you that. I have to confess to God many times that my walk is not the worthy walk. And I would hope, if you're saved, that you desire to have a worthy walk as well. What's part of that? Well, in, walk worthy of the Lord into all pleasing... Who do we want to please? We want to please the world or we want to please God? You know what? It's mutually exclusive, isn't it? You can't please both. Some people think somehow you can. It's just wishy-washy Christians think, well, I'm going to please my unsaved friends and kind of when I'm around them, but I'm going to please God. Like, 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 when, they're around, when, he, when, like when they're around their unsaved friends, God's not there. You know, <laughs> Like somehow you just sort of, God, you stay over here and, I'll with, when I'm with my worldly friends? No, you can't do that. If a person is saved, first of all, what they're indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Uh, they are, God's with them all the time. And by the way, I need to remind myself of that, too, as well. But uh, going back to uh, chapter 2 and verse, uh, Colossians 2 and verse uh, 7. 
And we really got kind of get into some more uh, meat here, I believe. It says, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding there with thanksgiving. Now, the word rooted and built up is the idea of a foundation, isn't it? Um, rooted and built up. You know, if we have a foundation in anything other than truth, we're not going to serve God. If we're doing things that are not scriptural, we're not going to be serving God to please Him. And so, so important to be rooted and built up, have that foundation in Christ. Um, you know, again, too many believers today, part of the reason why they're not really growing in the Lord more and pleasing Him is because some of the things they're doing are just not of God. They're just, they're listening to the wrong people. I just don't understand that. Well, I understand it, but I mean, I, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just sad, because I have to battle it myself, but we have, there's so many voices out there, I'm talking about as far as the world screaming at us, wanting us to do this and do that, and do it this way, and here's what all the scientists say, and, right, and here's what the doctors say, and, here, and so much of that is just blatantly unscriptural, you know. But, uh, you know, the majority are doing it, so people think, well, I've got to do If the majority are doing it, it must be right. I'm here to tell you if the majority are doing it, most of the time it's wrong. That's true throughout world history. Nothing's changed. You know, but I think it's so sad. Again, talk radio. I don't know how I get sick of it hearing, uh, oh, well, you know, the majority of people think this. Well, you know what? Even if it's something I agree with, <laughs> more often than not, you know, uh, it doesn't mean that's, that's not the reason to believe it or be in favor of it. Let's be in favor of something because it lines up with the Word of God. It's a biblical principle there. So, you know, but so I just like give the example of that, the same-sex marriage abomination. Uh, look, the, the numbers keep going up as far as, it's just a matter of time before it'll be legal in all 50 states. And, it won't, and by the way, it won't stop with that. There's all kinds of other, even, well, I'm worse, but there's all kinds of other perversions connected with that that are, on, that are part of the picture too. But, uh, Rooted and built up in him. If you would keep your place here and turn to 1 Corinthians 3.11, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11. Verse 11 it says, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You know, some of you that have been involved in construction, and I think most of us, even if we're not involved in that, have an understanding how important a foundation is for a building, right? I just saw an article the other day about this big multi-story building in China that collapsed. And that's a very rapidly growing country, you know, but uh, there's a lot of corruption there, like many places, including in America, right? And I guess one of the things in those areas is they cut corners on building construction, and so... Uh, apparently, the reason why this huge building collapsed is because it had a very poor foundation. You can't build a huge building on a very thin foundation, you know. And they, di they did. And, you know, and the people made money and then, you know, went off and whatever. And meanwhile, people died, I'm sure, or, you know, as a result of that. But uh, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So it's so important to be rooted and built up in him built up in, and, and, and in, of course, the truths of God's word. Uh, established in the faith, uh, ground, now notice if you would, he says, established in the faith. Grounding of new Christians. That's important too, isn't it? That when people are saved, it does, sure, their salvation is, is, is sealed there at that point. But to grow in the Lord, they need to be, as you'll notice here, it says, uh, established in the faith as ye have been what? Taught. The importance of local churches teaching. The importance of a teaching part of that, that ministry here. And I know that happens at this church. And that's something that should happen. Uh, because otherwise we're not going to get grounded like we should. You see, what is one of the reasons why uh, lost people, I'm sorry, the reason why some young, young Christians get off in the wrong directions is because they don't get grounded. Some of you probably can attest to that. You can probably say, you know, earlier in my life I was saved, but I was involved in things I shouldn't have been, and I was in some areas I shouldn't have been, and you know what, it, it, it could very well have been, I can't say every case is different, but I mean, it could very well be that, you know, if there had been more of a grounding there at some point, if someone had done that, that would have been a big help to you. I think it would have been in my case. 
I was saved as a teenager, but I wasn't in a strong church. And I went through some years. I didn't lose my salvation, because we can't, right? But I sure didn't serve God like I should have for quite a while there. And none of us have arrived, but what I'm just trying to say is so important to be grounded. Uh, you know, it says here, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as ye have been taught. And so the importance of the grounding. But you know what? It's not just for young Christians. None of, we ought to all desire to have a teachable spirit. We ought to all desire to be ever, you know, to learn more. It, you know, that's just so important. It's my, I know it's my uh, desire to always be uh, teachable. You know, my pastor preaches, my pastor goes through a section of scripture. I don't ever want to say, well, you know, I've been through that a bunch of times. I don't think I can just sort of tune that out. And I don't want to do that. Uh, I want with the Lord's help to be listening and, 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 and be, a, a, you know, a, a taking that in and applying it. But then the last part of that verse is abounding therein with thanksgiving. Abounding is the idea of growing. You know, do you have a thankful spirit? Yep. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> uh, we ought to all desire to be thankful, shouldn't we? Because we have so much to be thankful for. Um, I'm thankful the winter's mostly over, at least not my way, <laughs> although not quite. Uh, but you know what? Even in the worst part of January, I should still be thankful. Even in the worst snowstorm, I should still be thankful. When it comes to July and it gets really hot, I should still be thankful. And I told you, I think last time when I was here, I'm determined this year that when it comes to hot weather, I'm not going to complain. <laughs> I'm going to be thankful. But you know what, even if we hadn't had a hard winter, I should still be thankful when, uh, when it's hot, you know. Um, when we ha I have mechanical problems in my car, I should still be thankful. When I'm not feeling well, I should still be thankful. When there's other things happening in my life, adversities, I should still be thankful. And uh, it, 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 we have an old nature that never wants, I, I had that message on being content, right? And uh, it's something we have to battle because we have an old nature that is never content and is never thankful. And it's always wanting more, and always wants this or that, or whatever it may be. And that's not always, I dealt mainly with the material things, but it could be other areas as well, a lot of other areas. So abounding, growing with a spirit of thanksgiving. Do you know what? If we show that spirit of thanksgiving, that will be a great testimony to the lost, because they don't have it, because they're in this materialistic America, they're fed by a system that is constantly telling them, you're not satisfied, you can't be satisfied, you want this, 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 and this, you want the latest of this, you want that promotion, you want this house, whatever it may be, you want this fame, you, it could be all kinds of things. So, abounding, growing with the spirit of thanksgiving. So we're seeing the importance here of being rooted, of being built up, and being established in the faith. Now it brings us to verse 8, and this is where the spoil is, okay? Um, the warning of verse 8. So we've had some verses dealing with warnings, some verses dealing with encouragement, some verses uh, dealing with just admonishing us far as, you know, you want to have that spirit of thanksgiving. But now notice verse, wait, verse 8 is a beware. Um, and so, look, I don't know about you, but when I see beware, I try to beware. So if it says beware of the dog, beware of high voltage, beware of whatever it may be, uh, I shouldn't just say, well, <laughs> that's probably not even right. You know, I mean, that's probably just the one that's fake. Well, it might be, but I'm, if it says beware of high voltage, I'm really going to pay attention, you know. If it says beware of the dog, oh, well, maybe it's, they don't have a dog anymore. Maybe they got one of those little little friendly dogs, but more than likely, it's probably going to be the other kind. Usually they say the ones you don't even hear coming are the ones you've got to watch out the most for. They come up quietly, you know, and suddenly they're there, <laughs> you know, uh, rather than some of the really loud, bark, little barky things. But, uh, but notice here, beware, again, lest any what? Man, yeah. Just like back in verse 4, where he says, and this I say, lest any man should beguile you. Verse 8, Paul here says to these believers, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Now, what does the word spoil here? This is Sunday school time. I mentioned this at the, towards the beginning of the Sunday school time. What does that word spoil mean here? It's not talking about spoiled luncheon meat or spoiled tuna salad, right? 
that you had the picnic too long, you know. Take away, rob. Yeah. Um, and you know, you can apply that in a lot of areas. Um, Satanist world system want to rob us of things. They want to rob us of our Christian joy. They want to rob us of, you know, you know, I mean, yeah, you know, you Christians, you don't have any fun. How often have we heard that? Well, you want to look at the world's idea of fun? <laughs> the misery they have. You know, I spent five years in the Navy. That was a hard time. I was a believer, but I was a young Christian. And again, I hadn't been grounded, so that was a real challenge for me. And there were certainly times where I didn't please God there. But I'll tell you this much. I saw plenty of lost people living wicked lives and the consequences of their sin. And, you know, they could say they had fun, but they sure didn't look like they were having fun the next day. <laughs> you know, the next morning after they went through a big drunk, you know. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, my, when I was down in the West Indies for a year and a half, and I guess got the first night I got there, my roommate come in late and threw up from a bunch of drinking, you know. Boy, he was really having, I'm being facetious now. He was really having fun, wasn't he? No, not really. You know, it's pathetic. It really was. It was sad. You know, and uh, he's lost. He's in spiritual darkness. What did he need? He needed the gospel of Jesus Christ. He needed to be saved. Uh, but that's what the world says. The world, the world lies, all right? The world deceives. The world says, oh, you're missing out on all this stuff. But we're not. You know, the Christian life is the only life. It's, you know, it's, we don't get saved by living a Christian life, but Christians ought to live a Christian life. It's as simple as that. We don't get saved by doing good works, but Christians ought to do good works to be a testimony to the lost. You know, we don't get saved by trying to have peace in our hearts, but a Christian will have peace in their heart. And go on and on with that. So notice he says, beware lest any man spoil you. Now notice some of the things that could be, can happen here. It says, through philosophy and vain deceit. Now, that's interesting, this word philosophy. Does anybody happen to know what that word means? If you were look it up in a dictionary, philosophy. It's the only place actually where it's used. It talks about the philosophers in Athens in Acts, I believe it's 17. But uh, what's the word philosophy actually mean? Love of knowledge, yeah, love of truth. <laughs> Philo says, you know, uh, Philadelphia, city of brotherly love, sometimes known as the city of brotherly shove. <laughs> I try to stay clear of Philly as much as possible. But uh, anyhow, I'm not, I'm not really excited about big cities. You know, that being said, I have to put a plug in. I appreciate those churches and those, those that want to have a ministry in big cities because that's an underrepresented part of America, no doubt about that. You've got millions of people in some of the biggest cities of America and a handful of sound churches, and that's sad, whereas you've got some other areas where you've got a whole bunch of, of New Testament model churches and very few people. So, but anyhow, so I am thankful for those that are willing to do that. I, I know a few churches I've you know, people are willing to go into a big city area and want to try to have a, It's hard. Of course, it's not easy anywhere, <laughs> okay? But it's harder there because that's such a collection there of humanism and unbiblical influences. It is true. It, it is more so, although it's, that's changing because of the Internet, because of mass communication. A lot of these ungodly influences have made their ways to the most rural location, I think we could say here, right? You know, this area is not immune to ungodly influences, is it, you know? Uh, that, there was a time when that was more true. That's not, not today. But, uh, but you know, he says, beware, let any man spoil you through philosophy. So while the, world, while, while the word philosophy uh, has the idea of uh, love of truth, it's very ironic, I believe, that the vast majority of people that talk about philosophy and whatever, they're talking about studying it, don't even believe in truth. <laughs> Not only aren't they, don't they have the right, you know, believe the right things, they don't even believe there is such a thing as truth, which is really quite amazing, isn't it? Um, but the word spoil here says someone rob you, plundering a house. Uh, one commentator about the word spoil here says, such is the menace of false teachers, though, who's, who persuade people to abandon truth for error are seducers and robbers. Um, you know what? These, these uh, it says, any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. These false teachers, of course, cannot ca cause those people who are already saved to lose their salvation. No one can, right? Including the person. But they can lead them into false doctrines and much unbiblical thinking. 
And that's the thing we have to most watch. If you're saved, that's right. We're not going to lose our salvation. Thank the Lord for that blessed doctrine. But we can certainly be led into false doctrines and unbiblical thinking. And uh, I think that last part is probably the, more, the bigger danger, uh, although the, the, you could certainly have some of the other as well. Um, but no doubt about it, false teachers certainly help keep the lost in spiritual darkness. That's what Satan wants. That's, that's, that's what his whole setup is. But uh, Paul is addressing the believers at the church at Colossae here. So I want to approach the rest of verse 8 from that perspective. So this word philosophy, as we noted, is love of truth or love of knowledge. Most people who call themselves philosophers are as far from the truth as you can get. Probably the biggest, if there was one secular degree today that would be the biggest waste of time, it would be a degree in philosophy. I would think, I'd have to think that. Because you're going to be having these total lost people who don't even believe in truth talking about what other lost people who don't believe in truth said. Something like that. Okay? So they'd start back with the ancient Greeks and go forward to today. A bunch of lost people in spiritual darkness. It'd be like, it'd be like the analogy, uh, if truth is in this corner, they'd be looking everywhere else in the building except there. That'd be the one place they wouldn't go. And of course, say, well, where is truth? Well, God's preserved it for us in his word for us. A standard of truth. But the world system doesn't believe that. Not only the, the, the typical lost person that's into the world's philosophies, not only do, don't they believe the Bible is a standard of truth, as I said earlier, they don't even believe there's such a thing as truth. Can you imagine that? So how do they go through life? Well, sad. sad. It's a sad way they go through life. It really is. But, uh, and, I, and again, this has changed. This has changed. There was a time in the earlier decades in America where even though the majority were probably lost, at least they believed the Bible was a standard of truth. They believed some things in the Bible. They thought the Bible was, this was wrong. They, you know, you could have said to them, well, why is this wrong? If you said to them, this is wrong because the Bible says it's wrong, they'd say, oh, yeah, I believe that. Even if they were lost now, understand. You know, because they had some kind of grounding. The culture was more, was, the culture was closer to what the Bible teaches. And that's changed, and it's changed dramatically. And, that, and it, you see that. That's exactly what, why we have such a change in our culture today. But, uh, you know, the word philosophy is only used here once, but it, it is to talk about the philosophers. Let's look real quick. Keep your place here. We've got a couple minutes left. Acts chapter 17 and verse 18. Acts chapter 17 and verse 18. Acts 17, of course, I mentioned about Athens. And uh, Athens was in ancient Greece, and of course it was part of the Roman Empire at this time, but it was a center of, um, of, of, of Greek philosophy. It was a, a center of tremendous idolatry as well. Um, had both. It had both. It had philosophers that didn't believe in the old Greek gods, but they had their own humanistic philosophies. It had both there. Verse 18, this is, Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans, and of the Stoics, encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Others some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. They didn't know anything about that. That was strange to them. The idea of the Son of God uh, dying on the cross and rising again, that was strange to them. They didn't know anything about that. They didn't have any foundation. Because you can see, understand, these weren't Jews here in Athens. These were pagan Gentiles, right, who were into Greek philosophy. Uh, they said they loved truth, but they actually had no use for truth. Actually, it's interesting if you do a study on it, particularly the Epicureans. Uh, this is well known. It was founded by a man, you ready for this, a man named Epicurus. <laughs> okay? Now, that's not real profound. But uh, anyway, Epicurus was like an early evolutionist. He actually believed uh, things evolved. Uh, he didn't have it all worked out like Darwin and some later ones did, uh, supposing this false idea, but I'm just saying they had an evolutionary thinking. And so what did they not have is a belief in a creator God. That's what they didn't have. Okay? They didn't even think that, think that way at all, and that's still true for most people in this world today. But uh, the philosophers of, uh, of Athens there, most of them did not even believe there's such a thing as truth. Um, 
But uh, there are many scriptures we could go to, and I want to look at a couple that deal with this reality of truth. Again, that's a foundational principle, though, isn't it? If there is no such thing as truth, then there's nothing to believe. And sad, we have a lot of people that are... Uh, you say, well, what do... Poli-? Again, let me kind of go over this again. So what do so many people in our popular culture believe? Well, they believe what everybody else believes. You say, well, how does that work? Well, whatever the majority on their social network sites say for the, for the moment, which may be different next week, okay, or the week after. Whatever the polls say this week, which may be different than next week and probably will be. So they're constantly fluctuating. They have no, they're not grounded on anything. It's really sad. Look, if you would, to John chapter 17. And verse 17, please. John chapter 17 and verse 17. Here, part of the Lord's Prayer here. John chapter 17, verse 17. Let's look at verse 16, just to get a little more of the context. He says, They are not of the world. I'm talking about his disciples now. Even as I am not of the world. Notice verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And that's a, one of the best verses we have in the scriptures. I mean, there's many you can go to, but that's a, that's a great verse there. It's a great verse there. Thy word is truth. Thank the Lord that we have a standard of truth. And it's found in God's word. He's preserved it for us. The God that made everything from nothing had no trouble in preserving his word. Psalm 25, verse 5. Psalm chapter 25. And verse 5, please. David here says, Lead me in thy truth, and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. So, you know what? That's a great, that's a great verse there, isn't it? Lead me in thy truth. Boy, that's, a, that's, a, that's an encouragement for us. We ought to desire to be led in God's truth. Just like David here. Uh, David was a man after God's own heart. Wasn't perfect. We know that, right? And that's in the God's. We know that in the scriptures. But David here says, Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. So, a teachable spirit, a desire to be led in the truth of God's word. Uh, David didn't even have the whole word of God back then. He mainly had the law back then, you know, the Pentateuch and the law. Uh, well, same thing here. And, you know, but uh, so he had that. Uh, well, the law is independent, too, I should say. But, uh, you know, he, had, he just had part of the word. What I'm trying to say is he just had part of the word of God. And what he had, though, he wanted to be led in. He wanted to have that as a standard for his life. Uh, again, though, we can't, uh, the word of God isn't going to be able to direct us and challenge us if we're not open to that. If we say, I know this, I, don't, I know that someone says, well, this, this is scriptural. Well, I don't care. I'm going to do it my way anyway. Closed, right? Not teachable there. Maybe teachable in other areas, but not teachable there. Well, this is what the majority of people are doing at XYZ Church over here, so that's what we should do. Well, not if it's not scriptural. I don't care if every church in the county does it that way. Every church in the state does it that way. If it's not biblical, we shouldn't do it. And uh, that's just the reality of it. We want to be obedient to God. You know, we ought to love the truths of God's word. So the warning about philosophy in Colossians 2.8 is a warning about adopting the world's philosophy. Now, the word philosophy is not an inherently evil word, okay? I don't use it a lot, but I guess you can use it appropriately if you talk about philosophy of, uh, you know, of education or something, having the right one. I've, I've probably used it there. I have used it there, I should say. Because uh, after all, in the true sense of the word, the word means love of truth, right? I'm just telling you, most people, when they talk about philosophy have the wrong one, and don't even believe there's such a thing as truth. But uh, all the world's philosophies are at their core unbiblical and humanistic. They're anti-God. You know, like the late Henry Morse had a, uh, wrote a number of books. He was a creationism writer. And one of his books was called The Long War Against God. It's a good book. I'd recommend it. I'm not saying I agree with every last thing in there, but I'm saying it's a good book overall. And, uh, but basically it looks at after the fall of Adam and Eve and to, to this present day. Well, you know, up until 
until he passed away, or that, you know, last, last part of the last century, okay? But uh, that's right. This world system has always been war with God. This world system always will be at war with God. Of course, I say always, until, until the second coming of Jesus Christ. And then they won't be, well, then you have that brief time at the end of the millennial reign. But in eternity future, there, of course, won't be. Uh, sadly, all the people in this world that are at war with God will be in, in hell. That's where they'll be. But, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that's so prevalent as we finish out just a, a couple minutes here, I want to look at uh, one or two more things here. But uh, one of the things about the world's philosophies that are so prevalent is that it relies on human reasoning. Human reasoning. But you know what, again, let's see what the Word of God says about human reasoning. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. Please turn there. We're just going to look at a couple of verses quickly and then we'll have a word of prayer here. Proverbs chapter 12. I'm mean, sorry, Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12. Proverbs 14, verse 12. Pretty familiar verse, I suspect. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. How many times have we heard that from the world? The world says, oh, this seems right. This seems right to me. This, or even worse, this feels right. <laughs> That's even less scriptural, okay? Because the, word, the feelings of man are just about the most unreliable things you can get. You know, uh, you won't see that word feel used much in the Bible in, in terms of, in fact, you don't really see it at all. But there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And then one more verse here. 1 Corinthians uh, well, a couple of verses, but one more section. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verses 19 through 21. We'll stop with that. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19. Again, this is talking about the world's idea of wisdom. The world has its own idea of wisdom, right? The world says, oh, we're wise, we know so much. Um, but verse 19 says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. Again, this is the world's wisdom and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? The Greek philosophers had the wisdom of the world. The humanistic, uh, unbiblical thinking of today is the wisdom of the world. It is not biblical wisdom. It is a false wisdom. It's the world's idea of wisdom. Um, he says, it, for it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them believe. Now that's simply saying, not that preaching is foolish, it is saying that the world thinks it's foolish. The world looks at that. And if you do any witnessing for Jesus Christ, especially today, you find that out pretty quick. That's what they think, the average lost person, right? And so, let's have a, thank, appreciate your uh, attention this morning, and let's have a word of prayer and close out our Sunday school. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Uh, this portion in Colossians and some of the ver other verses we looked at. I pray now, Lord, for the service to follow, guide and direct. And pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.